Does God play dice with nature? Einstein thought not, at least according to reports. Here we describe a traveling wave group that mixes determinism with probability. The screen is in four parts, massless particles on the top left, massive particles on the top right, probability on the bottom left and determinism on the bottom right. We'll start with electromagnetism. It's very well understood. It's described by Maxwell's equations and it's deterministic. To this we add quantization described by Planck's law and together we derive a traveling wave group. Here it is and it contains two principal parts a traveling wave and an envelope function. The traveling wave can be written the exponent of i k dot r minus i omega t k is the wave vector, r is the position coordinate, omega is the angular frequency, t is the time coordinate. You can see it's a traveling sine wave because when k dot r is equal to omega t, psi is a maximum. And the velocity is equal to omega divided by k, which is equal to the frequency divided, multiplied by the wavelength of a traveling sinusoidal plane wave. This is the phase velocity. The envelope function also travels and typically travels with a different velocity from the carrier wave, the group velocity. What about this amplitude function A? Quantization defines it and for the simple case of 1D it's given by this formula where sigma is an experimental value that we'll illustrate on the next slide. The wave function psi is identified with the electric field or the magnetic field. Here it is, here's the wave group and the length of the wave group depends on sigma. If E is in the plane of the screen, the magnetic field H is in a plane normal to the screen. Imagine this electric field interacting with the bound of electron of an atom. If the phase of that electron is unknown, it's a hidden variable, as in the beta theory. So here is one example of a hidden variable. We can derive several properties from this traveling wave group. First of all, we apply the Schrodinger operators. Here's the energy operator, and it gives us Planck's law. And here's the momentum operator, and it gives us the de Broglie relationship, because k is inversely proportional to lambda. Or we can put t equals zero in the traveling wave group, and we find one of Heisenberg's uncertainty principles, dx dk equals one, or if we put x equals zero, the other uncertainty principle. So it is in electromagnetism, the quantal properties proceed from the wave group and the uncertainty postulates are written as a theory. Now we're going to take this traveling wave group and apply it to mass amplitude. To do so, we're going to have to introduce special relativity. Here it is. What works for electromagnetism will work for electron, neutron and proton spectroscopies. Energy squared is equal to momentum squared plus mass squared. Or rewriting h squared omega squared is equal to h squared k squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth. Differentiating we find omega over k times d omega by dk is equal to c squared. We've met some of these terms before. Omega over k is the phase velocity. And d omega by dk is the velocity of that envelope function. It's the group velocity and it's easy to show this. So it is the product of the phase and group velocities is equal to c squared. Now we're going to take a step backwards to an unusual case which is electromagnetism in a refractive medium.
and we're going to use three arguments. The first argument is a ray of light striking a glass block is bent by it. And the bending is described by Snell's law. And it's explained by a change in the velocity of the beam as it passes into the glass block. That's the phase velocity. The second argument is the measurement of Foucault of the speed of light in water and he found it is less than the speed of light in air. He was measuring the group velocity. Here we simulate, using Maxwell's equations, a pulse of light entering at normal incidence a glass block. And the simulation is displayed here at four moments in time and you can see several features. As time progresses, the reflected beam and the transmitted beam separate. This is as you would, expe as you would expect. And the velocity inside the glass is clearly less than the velocity uh, in the air. You can see that the wavelength in the glass is shorter than the wavelength in the air, and that's the reason for the lower velocity. But notice a very special feature, which is the carrier wave stays in phase with the peak of the wave group through time. And we've analysed a lot more than four pulses and found that is always the case. So we conclude that in light, in a refractive medium, the phase velocity is equal to the group velocity is equal to c over n and this is a special case. But for particles in vacuo, vacuo we have that the phase velocity times the group velocity is equal to c squared. Now we know from special relativity that the group velocity, the velocity that we measure in the lab and that we're familiar with, must be less than c. And this implies that the phase velocity must be more than c. The phase velocity cannot be measured directly, but it is the ratio of two measurable values, omega divided by k. So it's another example of a hidden variable. Here we've plotted omega and k for light in the red line and for particles. For light, the slope of the line is equal to c, which is a physical constant, and it's a straight line. At any k, the frequency of a particle is greater than the frequency of light of the same momentum. And at low k, the frequency of the particle is dominated by the rest mass. Here we plot the velocities, two of them, the group velocity on the bottom and the phase velocity on the top. The group velocity first at low k, the group velocity is close to zero. At high k, as in special relativity, the group velocity tends to c. Likewise, the phase velocity tends to c at high momentum. But at low momentum, the phase velocity tends to infinity. So we have hidden variables and they do affect the probability measurements. But let's think about measurement for a moment. And we're going to think in three steps. First of all, notice that probability has been fundamental in measurement since long before the photon was quantized. And we'll illustrate this first in a single measurement. When we make a single measurement, we assume something. We assume that the outcome is the most probable result from the experimental arrangement. And we assume also that the measurement has an uncertainty that can in principle be predicted by the theory of our travelling wave group. That's a single measurement. When we make a double measurement, we have two measurements and we assume that the most probable result 
is the mean of those two measurements, and the difference of two measurements is a rough estimate of the uncertainty of those measurements. So that's two measurements. What about multiple measurements? Well, then what we do is we divide the measurements into channels and we plot the frequencies in those channels and fit them to a normal curve. Then we make an assumption. We assume that the most probable measurement is the peak of that normal curve. And the full width half maximum is the uncertainty of those curves. We can make that mean measurement as accurate as, accurate as we like by increasing the number of data points. So that's how our assumptions work with multiple measurements. Notice this normal distribution is not only the same distribution as the envelope of our wave group for a freely propagating wave, but it's causally related, and this is true with or without quantization. So we arrive at the postulates of Bohm and Babb for quantum mechanics. There are two postulates. One is about theory and it's deterministic, and one's about measurement and it's probabilistic. The first postulate is, the state of a quantum mechanical system is defined by a continuous single-valued wave function chi of x, which obeys a deterministic equation of motion, Schrodinger's equation. And the second postulate is about measurement. The wave function determines the probabilities of the possible results of any measurement on the system. Or, equivalently, the average expectation value for an ensemble of measurements of any observable R is de derived from Shai through the algorithm shown. It's the same algorithm as we used earlier. So, how do we interpret this travelling wave function? Firstly, uncertainty in measurement predates quantum theory and is independent of it. Secondly, uncertainty in massive particles is similar to electromagnetism but modified by special relativity. And thirdly, it follows that indeterminism is due to hidden variables sometimes and measurement always. There are other consequences for this travelling wave group. The relative phase and group velocities define rest mass. Vp minus Vg is equal to m0 squared c to the fourth divided by pe momentum times energy. Secondly, the relative speed in the lab frame translates in the particle rest frame to vg equals zero and phase velocity equals to infinity. Then, within the particle wave group, time becomes Newtonian. Further details can be found in this open access research paper, a wave group for entanglement linking uncertainties in space and time, in the Journal of Modern Physics, published in March 2012. And we have a postscript on predestination. If nature is pre-planned, only God could do it. <laughs>